Hello everyone. This is the 42 part of the story, Magical Journey in Harry Potter World. Chapter 115, Preparations and Warm-Up. Quinn and Phileas exited the hospital wing after Quinn's hands had healed enough. Poppy had bandaged them up and told Quinn not to move them. She finally told him to return after he was done to complete his recovery. Professor, would it be all right if we take a detour, requested Quinn to the diminutive goblin at his side. I would like to change out of these clothes. Quinn straightened his clothes to show that the front of his shirt was stained in blood. The blood stains were from when Quinn had wiped his knuckles that had the Axionite's blood on them with his shirt. I wouldn't feel comfortable when I have blood on my clothes. Especially when I am about to visit the headmaster. Phileas looked at and saw that Quinn's clothes were indeed stained with blood. If you want, Mr. West, I can vanish that blood off your shirt, offered Phileas, knowing that it wouldn't be good for a child to walk around with blood on his clothes. I appreciate the offer, Professor, but I would like to change these out. Even if these clothes were cleaned of the blood, I'll still be uncomfortable in them, replied Quinn. Phileas nodded and accepted Quinn's request, if that is so, then we can take a detour to change your clothes. I'm sure that the headmaster won't mind. Excellent, he is indeed a good messenger, thought Quinn. He felt positive that things would end up without any complications. Quinn and Phileas climbed up to the fifth floor, but then, Quinn turned to the opposite direction from the Ravenclaw dorms. Phileas asked, where are you going, Mr. West? To the AID classroom, Professor. I have a set of clothes there, answered Quinn. I don't want to go to the dorms and worry my friends. I understand, Mr. West. Let's proceed to your office, then, nodded Phileas, empathizing with Quinn. Quinn and Phileas walked to the AID office and Quinn invited his head of house inside. Professor, please, make yourself comfortable. I'll change my clothes, and we'll be off in no time, said Quinn. He aimed his hand at the client chairs while he unlocked the workshop door and entered inside. He closed the door behind him and immediately started to move quickly. I don't have much time. Let's get everything over with quickly, thought Quinn, a few things moved in the workshop. One of the drawers opened, and a few sheets of paper flew out from the ream of paper inside. From the same drawer, a fountain pen flew out after the sheet of paper. On the other side of the workshop, a cabinet opened, and from inside came a white short-sleeved t-shirt, a grey and white dynamic work jacket, and red-grey-black work trousers. As Quinn started to change his clothes, the fountain pen uncapped and glided across the page. It penned the words Quinn wanted. By the time Quinn was done dressing up, the pen had penned two and a half pages of words. The pages flew towards the side of the room, and after two glows of light, Quinn exited the workshop. His work was done. Let's go, Professor. I'm ready, said Quinn, dressed in new clothes. His jacket wasn't zipped up, so the white t-shirt he was wearing inside could be seen. Phileas saw Quinn dressed up in new clothes and nodded before he hopped out of his chair. Excellent. Let's go, Mr. West. As the two exited the office, Phileas couldn't help but ask, what are you using to light up the room, Mr. West? I was surprised to see no candles in the room. I knew you would ask about them, Professor, laughed Quinn. I used rune applications on metal platings designed to work as light sources. I used the basic Lumo spell as a base inspiration and then worked up from there. I had to specify the dispersion, color tone, warmth, and intensity. The resulting rune cluster was what you saw up there. Quinn had already thought of pitching his light rune designs in the summer break to his grandfather and Leah. This was another thing that could bring a revolution in the existing industry and could replace the standard everlasting, long-lasting, candles that were used everywhere. Flitwick looked at his smiling student and asked, Why are you smiling, Mr. West? From what I've told you, you are in trouble. He was a little concerned because Quinn wasn't showing any of the signs that would be visible after what had transpired. Quinn was cavalier and engaging instead of silent and shocked. I'm all right, Professor. I understand the situation I was in and how things could have turned out if things had gone differently. If you are thinking why I am so casual about the situation, said Quinn as the smile drained from his face. This is my attempt at self-preservation through disassociation. I'm detaching myself from the situation by acting like it's nothing serious. I wanted to change clothes because they made me think that blood could very easily have been mine. 
Quinn sneakily glanced at Phileas to see if his lie worked. From the moment Quinn had opened the door, he hadn't been scared in the least. He had assessed the situation and made sure to secure his safety before taking any action. All of them would find that Quinn's behavior was consistent throughout the ordeal, as from the very first words in which Quinn had joked about disturbing the conversation between the Axionites and Marauders to him, acting goofily with Poppy he had acted in a similar way. I see, Mr. West, said Phileas after a pause. Please be assured that those people will be brought to justice, and the faculty will do its best to improve security. I personally will make sure that none of my students are harmed. Thank you for your kind words, Professor. They mean a lot, smiled Quinn. He chuckled as he continued. I'm guessing that the Shrieking Shack passage will be closed down. Definitely, Mr. West, smiled Phileas. No more outside castle visits for you. A.W., that's lame, laughed Quinn, not worried about it because he knew many more passageways that would allow him to sneak out of the castle. As the student and professor continued to talk, the pair arrived at the headmaster's office. All right, let's see how this goes, thought Quinn as Phileas said the password. The entrance opened. Scene break. Lily and Ivy Potter practically rushed to the hospital wing. They had been told that Harry had come close to being kidnapped by the terrorist group called Novellus Axionites, who had infiltrated Hogwarts and had captured Harry in broad daylight. They were semi-relieved to hear that the attempt was thwarted because the marauders had been partying in the Shrieking Shack. When they heard that Harry was resting at the hospital, both mother and sister ran to see Harry. Inside the hospital wing, they saw Poppy tending a sleeping Harry while casting some spells at Harry's head. Poppy, how is he? asked Lily, her eyes stuck to her son. Poppy turned to her colleague and gave her the same answer that she had given the father. He hit his head on the ground. Other than that, he is fine. He's sleeping and will wake up in a while. She waved her wand, and two bar stools came gliding for Lily and Ivy to sit down. This was close, wasn't it? said Poppy as she herself took a seat. To think they used the tunnel made for Remus. I used to guide him to that house every month when he was still a student here. Everything from the Hoomping Willow to the Shrieking Shack, including the passage that joined the two, had been added after Remus Lupin had sent back the reply in which he said he would be attending Hogwarts. The school had added these landmarks to ensure that Remus could go through his lycanthrope transformation in isolation, and continue to study at the school with no one knowing about his condition. Every evening, Poppy would guide the then teenager Remus to the Shrieking Shack. The house had been commissioned by the school and got its name because, in the absence of Wolfsbane Potion, Remus would bite and scratch himself due to a lack of humans to infect. Albus Dumbledore encouraged the rumors about the house being haunted because they would keep people from approaching the building, making it a safe haven for Remus to go through his monthly transformation. James, Sirius, and Remus were lucky to be there. To think Remus's condition would help thwart the attempt, sighed Lily as she ran a hand through Harry's hair. They were indeed lucky, Poppy, too, sighed. To think not only those three were at the shack for Remus, but the kidnappers also used the same route, and finally Quinn also used the same passage. Lily and Ivy both looked up at the matron, who was shaking her head at her semi-apprentice's antics. Quinn, asked Ivy, surprised to hear that name in the current situation. Yes, apparently that child had been sneaking in and out of the castle to visit Hogsmeade outside of the Hogsmeade weekend. He used that passage as his sneak route. Today, after he was returning from Hogsmeade, he chanced upon the tense situation and saw wands pointed from both parties. How's he? asked Lily with wide eyes, looking around to see if Quinn was lying on another bed. He's fine. Phileas took him to meet the headmaster. Quinn punched the man who was holding Harry hostage, sighed Poppy, thinking about Quinn's hands. That child's hands were in bad shape. He, a 14-year-old, hit an adult enough times to draw blood and break his bones. Despite this, he smiled the entire time. A 14-year-old wasn't developed enough and had low strength. Poppy realized that, and when Quinn told her that he broke the man's jaw, she imagined from checking Quinn's hands how many times Quinn had to punch to break a person's face. Quinn's knuckles would have been injured way before accomplishing what he had. So Poppy realized that Quinn had ignored the pain and had kept hitting. While Poppy was thinking about Quinn, Ivy, too, was thinking about him. She couldn't believe that Quinn had once again saved Harry from another dangerous situation. 
Ivy had just managed to put aside the thoughts about Quinn's slip about the Chamber of Secrets, but now this happened, and she again thought about Quinn. From her very first year, Quinn West had been a part of her school life one way or another. He would always be connected to the bizarre and wild incidents that happened to her and her friends. In the first year, he had warned them about the Philosopher's Stone's chambers, and she was sure that he had been inside those chambers. In the second year, he had caught her trying to sneak into Slytherin's common room. He had told them about the basilisk and the Chamber of Secrets and saved them from the monster inside the chamber. He had found things before anyone else and seemed to know everything about what was happening. In her third year, he had made Hermione take him to the past because he wanted to save himself by creating a time travel loop. How did he get injured? She still doesn't know because Quinn was somehow able to avoid that entire line of questioning. Then she saw Quinn produce the biggest patronus she had ever seen. She thought that those few hours completed the yearly quota of interaction with Quinn West, but now that she heard this, Ivy realized she was wrong. He had saved her brother and had gotten injured while doing it. Ivy remained silent in her thoughts as Lily and Poppy continued to talk about the incident that took place today. Scene break. Quinn walked inside the headmaster's office and he had to say that Dumbledore's office was interesting, to say the least. It was a large and beautiful circular room, full of funny little noises. Several curious silver instruments stood on spindle-legged tables. They whirred and emitted little puffs of smoke. Portraits of old headmasters and headmistresses, some gently snoozing, covered the walls of the office. Every headmaster, or headmistress, had their names and their period of tenure on their frames. He also saw an enormous, claw-footed desk and, sitting on a shelf behind it, a shabby, tattered wizard's hat, the sorting hat. Quinn's eyes were also attracted to the shelves after shelves of old tomes and books that graced a knowledgeable presence to the headmaster's chaotic office. If Quinn had been left here with no supervision, he would have definitely opened every book and read through every page. As Quinn walked in, he looked over his shoulder and saw a golden perch beside the room's entrance. Quinn identified the golden perch as the phoenix's resting place. After taking in the interior of the headmaster's office, Quinn nodded in satisfaction. Mr. West, would you like to share your thoughts with us? Quinn looked to his front and saw Albus Dumbledore, the headmaster of Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, clad in purple robes with stars, sitting behind his desk. He was looking at him through the half-moon glasses with a smile on his face. Certainly, headmaster. I was thinking that, after observing your office's interior, my office on the fifth floor is better. A relaxed smile on his face as he spoke. A chuckle came from the right, and a deep hum from the left came in response as James Potter chuckled and Severus Snape looked at Quinn warningly. Is that so? It saddens me a little to hear that. I have put in a lot of work to make my office unique and fun. The owner of the office smiled through his beard. I even had to suffer from the nagging of the previous owners for years before they settled down. Dumbledore roamed his eyes at the sleeping portraits of previous headmasters and headmistresses who occupied this office before him. I'm not saying that your office isn't unique and fun, headmaster. I agree with you. Your office has a charm that sets it apart from others. It's just that mine is better, smiled Quinn. Dumbledore smiled and then looked at the other three men in the room. James, Severus, Phileas. You three can leave. James, you should join your family down in the hospital wing. My dear professors, it's almost dinner time, I'm sure you all are hungry. Please, proceed to the Great Hall, said Dumbledore before turning Quinn. Mr. West and I will have a short talk before joining you at the Great Hall. James Potter and Severus Snape walked past Quinn. Both had different thoughts in their minds. James was thankful to Quinn for knocking out the Axionite, who was about to get away with his son. If Quinn hadn't interfered, James didn't know what he would be doing now. He wasn't sure where his son would be or if he would even be safe. Snape looked both pleased and conflicted. He was pleased that his attempt to convey that Remus Lupin was a werewolf was successful because, from what James had said, Quinn already knew about it and had understood what he was trying to do. Snape was conflicted because Quinn hadn't outed Remus as a werewolf to the school or family. Their eyes met and they immediately became hostile towards each other. Before Quinn had entered the office, they had been exchanging taunts to each other. They only stopped because Dumbledore scolded them both. 
Phileas tagged along with his former students, so the three men exited the headmaster's office. They left behind Quinn and Dumbledore in the office. Please take a seat, Mr. West, said Dumbledore, and with a wave of his hand, a chair was pulled back for Quinn. Thank you, headmaster, said Quinn as he sat down. You can call me professor like your other teachers, Mr. West, said Dumbledore as Quinn made himself comfortable. You are the head of the school, headmaster. I like to use the proper title when I address people, smiled Quinn. Maybe if you teach the alchemy class in my sixth and seventh year, I'll call you professor. Dumbledore looked interested at the mention of alchemy. He asked with his eyes shining with interest. You are interested in alchemy, Mr. West. I haven't seen many students who are interested in alchemy. The lack of interested students is the reason we have to cancel the alchemy subject every year. Alchemy is magic, headmaster. I'm interested in anything that is magic, stated Quinn as if he was stating a universal fact. Your grades certainly show that. They are truly impressive, Mr. West, said Dumbledore as he turned parchments on his desk. Other than potions and history of magic. You have scored more than 100% in every exam of every subject in your four years at Hogwarts. Even in the two mentioned subjects, you haven't once scored anything less than an outstanding. Quinn shrugged and smiled, I do well in class, headmaster. It's what I like to do. Dumbledore continued to turn parchments, stopped at a certain parchment, and said. Your establishment of an office on the fifth floor, allowed by Phileas. You've called it the AID, and if I recall correctly, it has been a huge success. The notes that you release every year have been a great success, even though I haven't read them, the faculty have told me that they are excellent. You have been known to create interesting knickknacks that see great sales, and interestingly, none of them have been banned by our caretaker, something that I consider a big accomplishment. The AID has become popular for helping other students which is another great and unique accomplishment. Tell me, Mr. West. Why did you start this initiative of yours, asked Dumbledore, curious about the birth of the AID. He hadn't seen something like this in Hogwarts before. Usually, prefects, headboys, and headgirls would be the students who helped the other students. If they couldn't solve the problem, they would go to the professors. But ever since AID had opened up in Hogwarts, there had been a steady increase of students relying on Quinn to help them. In one of the faculty meetings this year, the faculty had noted that they had seen a dive in the number of younger students coming to them for help. They connected it to the presence and ever-growing popularity of AID. Every year the AID would gain a new batch of students. After the professors exchanged their experiences, they realized that the AID had been equally popular in every house. No student, regardless of their house, had ever turned away from the door of AID. If they had a problem, A.I.D was the space. Pureblood students who had a strong sense of blood supremacy used A.I.D's services because Quinn was a pureblood himself. Muggleborn students, who were on the opposite side of the spectrum, didn't shy away from the AID, because it was a place that would explain anything they wanted to know about the new and unknown magical world. The AID was an establishment that reached every type of student present in Hogwarts. Dumbledore, who got informed about what was happening in the school from the faculty meeting, became impressed and curious about the AID and how it was able to rise up to this point in only three years. Hum, originally, I wanted to do something different. Create something that nobody in Hogwarts had ever done and something different from what my schoolmates were currently doing, answered Quinn, not telling the real reason about A.I.D.S founding. He still provided Dumbledore with some actual facts, though. I wanted to create something of my own and, in process, use magic. I wasn't expecting it to get this big. But well, I guess I'm happy how things turned out. I have more than a hundred students who would do what I ask of them, students from all houses on every step of the social ladder. Indeed, I guess I'm happy how things turned out, thought Quinn. I see, said Dumbledore and once again started to turn the parchments and stopped when he saw something that interested him. Hum, this here says that you had access to the restricted section of the library for the entire year, last year. He looked up at Quinn and said, it was given to you by Professor Lockhart. Quinn nodded and confirmed the statement from Dumbledore but didn't say a single word in response. Dumbledore waited for a moment for Quinn to speak something, but when he didn't say anything, Dumbledore asked. May I ask why did you ask for the pass to the restricted section? I was interested in the books there, headmaster, replied Quinn, keeping it short. 
And Professor Lockhart gave you the pass for the entire year? Not a particular book, but an entire year, asked Dumbledore. Quinn shrugged in reply, I established his fan club at Hogwarts. I was the reason for his popularity in the school, so I guess he simply allowed me to browse through the library because of that. Yes, I recall hearing about Professor Lockhart's fan club, said Dumbledore before asking with a pause. Did you have contact with Professor Lockhart after he left the school? Unfortunately, I lost contact with Professor Lockhart after he left his post. He was a fun person to listen to and hang around. He had fascinating stories to tell, answered Quinn. What books interested you, Mr. West, asked Dumbledore as he observed Quinn through his half-moon glasses. Hum, there were many, but mostly some advanced applications of what I was studying at the moment, answered Quinn, and he didn't lie. Dumbledore didn't know what level of magic he was studying at that point. Dumbledore once again waited for Quinn to explain what he meant by the vague answer, but Quinn didn't say a single more word. He once again looked down at his desk and turned some sheets before once again asking. You've been learning healing magic from Madame Pomfrey, stated Dumbledore as he looked at Quinn with surprise. Yes, answered Quinn with a single word. The third time around, Dumbledore finally caught up with what was happening. Do you want to become a healer, Mr. West? No, sir. Not at all. Healing is a type of magic, and I'm interested in anything that's magic, smiled Quinn. The headmaster stared at the student while the student looked around the office with a curious gaze. Headmaster, my view of your office is improving by the minute. It's growing on me, complimented Quinn. If Dumbledore didn't want to get straight to the point, Quinn also didn't mind stretching things along. Plus, he employed his usual strategy of letting the other person ask questions to control the flow of information. It seems I have gone off the topic, Mr. West, said Dumbledore and closed the file of parchments. It's just that I don't get to talk to students often. So whenever I do get to talk to a student, I get a little distracted as I want to know more about them. It's fine, sir. You are a busy man, the headmaster of Hogwarts, the supreme mugwump of the ICW, and the chief warlock of Wizengamart. All these titles and the responsibilities that come with them are time-consuming, said Quinn and then suggested as he looked at Dumbledore. If you aren't enjoying your current workload and if it makes you feel uncomfortable, perhaps you could drop a position or two and concentrate on fewer things. Dumbledore watched Quinn, and as Quinn said the last sentence, the headmaster smiled widely, more widely than he had smiled since Quinn had entered the office. Let's get to the point, Mr. West. Let's talk about what happened at the Shrieking Shack. Quinn held back the smile that was threatening to break out on his face and nodded. Let's. Chapter 116, The Talk, and the events that built up to it. What were you doing at the Shrieking Shack, Mr. West, asked Dumbledore to the student sitting in front of him. I was returning from Hogsmeade, Headmaster, answered Quinn to the question. And Shrieking Shack is the route that I used to travel back and forth from the castle and village. Today's situation had revealed that Quinn went out of the castle, so there was no reason for him to hide the fact that he went out to Hogsmeade. What were you doing in the village? questioned Dumbledore. What prompted you to leave the castle? Quinn raised his right hand and snapped his fingers for a playing card, a joker, with a royal blue back appear in his hands. I was out at the village to confirm the new design on my business cards. He then, with a flick of his wrist, threw the playing card from his right to left at a snapping speed, making a faint noise as the card jumped hands. Dumbledore's eyes from Quinn's right to left, following the card, and they widened a fraction when instead of the throwing card, Quinn's left was holding a black card with golden lettering. These cards are my main source of advertisement, headmaster, said Quinn as he leaned forward and gracefully placed the card on Dumbledore's desk, and the black business card glided on top of the polished surface of the table towards Dumbledore. Dumbledore removed his surprised eyes from the business card on his desk and looked at Quinn's hand, which had returned to resting on his lap and you couldn't do it from within the castle? Communicating via owls, perhaps, asked Dumbledore as he continued to stare at the card on the table. Some things come out better when you discuss them face to face, sir. As I said, these cards are my primary source of advertisement. I need for them to be perfect. Other than the slight widening of his eyes, the old headmaster didn't show any signs of surprise and picked up the card from the table to observe it. His experienced hands and knowledgeable eyes looked for magic laid into the cards. 
Dumbledore found that hidden under a layer of bogus charms laid animation charms and a protein charm, but other than that, no other magic was woven into the card. Dumbledore looked for how Quinn transformed a playing card into a business card, searching for a transfiguration charm or a simple cantrip, but there was nothing like that on the card. Which told Dumbledore that Quinn had accomplished it without magic, surprising him further. That was an impressive show of sleight of hand, Mr. West, complimented Dumbledore as he gently shook the card in his hand. I've heard that muggle magicians do tricks like these, but this is my first time seeing something like this. Thank you for the praise, smiled Quinn. Sleight of hand seems like magic, a skill that requires pure skill and dexterity to fool people. The smile widened into a wide grin. And I have found that it does wonder when I show it to magicals. I can get individuals to look at me with funny and, quite frankly, dumb faces. Did I make the same expression that you see on others? Quinn shook his head with a shallow smile, you barely made an expression, headmaster. It made me think that I should have done something more, wilder. Oh no, Mr. West. I thoroughly enjoyed it and was surprised, answered Dumbledore. I'm an old dog, who was a little slow on the uptake, that's all. Oh, please, headmaster. You aren't that old. You are what? A little over a hundred years old. You still have a full life ahead of you, chuckled Quinn and then gave a glance over to Dumbledore's face. You have the dressing sense, if you trim that beard off, you would immediately shave decades off your appearance. Dumbledore stroked his long beard and smiled, is that so? I will give it a thought. I'm a little attached to my beard, it has been with me for a long time. Follow your heart, sire. It will take you ways. Dumbledore was about to laugh in agreement, but then he realized that Quinn had taken him off the tangent and blinked a bit at the smiling student in front of him. There was a slight pause after Quinn's statement, and Dumbledore directly brought the conversation back on track. James tells me that you dash dot. Dumbledore started to speak, but Quinn cut him off. James, questioned Quinn, despite knowing who Dumbledore was talking about. The conversation a few seconds, even if it was off-topic, was going smoothly, and Quinn wanted to break the rhythm, so he asked the question to which he already knew the answer. James Potter, the person who escorted you to the castle, said Dumbledore, who indeed was slightly thrown off his rhythm. He wasn't used to being interrupted or being pulled out of topic. It had been years, even decades, since Dumbledore had experienced close to what he was doing with Quinn. Ah, or a Potter. I wasn't able to attribute the first name to him. Please do continue, gestured Quinn. Yes, as I was saying, James tells me that you knew that Professor Lupin is a werewolf. My question to you, Mr. West, is that if you understood what Professor Snape was trying to tell you, why didn't you reveal to anyone, asked Dumbledore, and his eyes shined with curiosity. Dumbledore was shocked that Snape had tried to reveal Remus's identity despite his insistence and order to not disclose the condition. But to think that the childish feuds would carry over to adulthood and Snape would try to circumvent the rules he had set an attempt, to point the students towards the answers. I understand that lycanthropy or the more funny word, werewolfry, is a disease. As long as people with lycanthropy take proper precautions, I wouldn't treat them negatively. Professor Lupin, from my view, took those proper precautions and made sure that the surrounding people wouldn't be affected, answered Quinn, speaking things from his heart. I don't think that just because Professor Lupin was something he can't do anything about, he should be segregated. As for why I didn't reveal his identity? He and the faculty were clearly trying to keep it a secret. I can read the room, so I kept quiet. Of course, if he had been a danger to the students. I would have revealed his identity to the entire school and have him kicked out of the school. Quinn had already spoken these things at the Shrieking Shack, so he didn't mind repeating them. Anything to keep the conversation where and how Quinn wanted to go. Let's talk about the fact that you intercepted the terrorist. But, Dumbledore was an experienced old goat. Even with Quinn's little tactics to keep the conversation moving in the direction he wanted, Dumbledore simply used blunt questions and his position as the headmaster to force the conversation back where he wanted. Hum. I wanted a little more time before we got here, but things are still within my expectations, thought Quinn and once again waited for Dumbledore to front a question. From what James described, the man that held Harry hostage got out of the room, the door suddenly shut close, and when the others got out, 
you were on top of the man and beating his face red with your fists, recalled Dumbledore. The headmaster took a conscious pause in which he stared at Quinn before asking. You didn't have your wand in your hands, Mr. West. How were you able to shut the door that was clearly shut with magic? Quinn stared at Dumbledore for a good few moments before raising his hand and pointing it at the folder of parchments that Dumbledore was previously reading from. His face scrunched up in concentration as one, two, five seconds went by before the folder flew up from the table and zoomed into Quinn's hand. Quinn breathed out a heavy breath and lightly smiled. I I can do a little wandless magic, headmasters. At that moment, I thought it was the best option for everyone if I separated the man from his associates. There, I established my limit, internally smiled Quinn. He looked down at the folder and opened it to read what Dumbledore had on him, but the speed at which he turned the pages made it seem like he was simply turning pages. I can't do any more than that. And that man had a wand pointed at Harry Potter, so I chose the physical route and forced him away from Harry, and then to make sure that he didn't have any other moment, I punched him. Quinn looked up from the parchments and continued. I've been told that you can't stop after an initial blow. You've to keep going until the hostile is no longer, well. Hostile. Quinn rubbed his upper arm with his opposite hand and whispered, I was scared and just followed what came to me instinctually. Feeling frightened in that situation was natural, and Quinn, on some level, was scared. Even if he had planned things to ensure that he was safe, Quinn still felt the fear that the situation could go wrong. So, right now, Quinn was simply using that slight feeling of fear to portray a dread that brought out his instincts. I understand, Mr. West. Things must have been terrifying for you at that moment. I will tell you something that I've heard from several auras and hit wizards I have met. Most of them told me that even after doing what they do for years, they still fear afraid before going into a dangerous situation. They tell me that fear is what keeps them on their toes and keeps their mind cautious. Quinn nodded, wholeheartedly agreeing with the fact that a healthy dose of fear helped in dangerous situations. Dumbledore observed Quinn with an inspecting gaze. There was something about Quinn that was bothering him. Ever since Quinn had entered the room, there was something that had been bothering Dumbledore. Something that he couldn't put his finger on. Quinn didn't show any signs of nervousness or worry about being in his office. And while Dumbledore wasn't trying to make anyone nervous, he understood that his position and reputation did bring that something in people when they met him. Then there was the fact that Quinn had shown that even though he wasn't reluctant to talk, his answers told him that Quinn wasn't going to completely open up. Dumbledore wasn't dense or a greenhorn, he understood what Quinn was trying to do. Short and vague answers, going off topics, trying to interrupt the conversations, not providing anything new that he didn't already know. He had deduced that Quinn used wandless magic to close the door. There was no other reasoning for the door suddenly closing. And Quinn had simply confirmed the clear fact by showcasing that he had wandless capabilities just enough to shut a door. Quinn simply confirmed that he punched the man to stop him. Dumbledore already knew that. Other than a few additional background facts, Quinn hadn't told him anything that would add to the narrative. Even before the two started to talk about the incident, Quinn had simply agreed with statements that he had put forward. Lockhart gave him an all-access pass to the restricted section for an entire year. Quinn's answer? Yes. Short and simply confirming a recorded fact. Why? I don't know, maybe he liked me. Vague conjecture and nothing definitive. What did he study? Advanced concepts. Everything in restricted section was advanced. Once again, too broad of an answer. He provided similar answers when asked about his healing lesson with Poppy. Dumbledore thought about it what didn't fit into place. He is prepared, a bit too prepared. He is too relaxed, noticed Dumbledore. But when he thought about Quinn's background and what he had learned from his faculty, it was just barely within an acceptable behavior from Quinn. He is too accepting, thought Dumbledore. Yes, that's it. He transitioned a bit too quickly. When Quinn spoke about fear, he showed some emotion that would be normal given the situation he had been through. But when I told him about auras and hit wizards, he accepted it too easily, recalled Dumbledore and reflected on it. The look in his eyes wasn't relief at not being judged. It was as if he already knew it and was showing his agreement. This tipped the scales in Dumbledore's head. 
He wanted to know what Quinn West was thinking. Here in front of him was George West's grandson. The grandson of the person with immense wealth and resources, who he had tried to bring to his side. Dumbledore had failed to persuade George West to join his side and his cause. Fortunately for him, George West had also refused to go to the other side and join Voldemort. If George West had joined Voldemort, then Malfoy's financial support would have seemed like pocket money allowance. Dumbledore's bubbling curiosity about Quinn, along with his family background, made Dumbledore decide his next course of action. He was going to use some magic to see what was going inside Quinn's head. Quinn was looking around Dumbledore's office when he noticed something from the corner of his eyes. Hum? He turned to face Dumbledore and saw the headmaster's eyes glittering and shining with an unnatural light. Ah. He is using magic to attract my eyes to his, thought Quinn. He is going to use legilimency. But Quinn wasn't scared. Not at all. Instead, he was excited. Except for Alan, his teacher, no person had ever challenged his mental occlumency shields. He wanted to see if Dumbledore's attack could pass through. The invisible, omnipresent radiation matter is also ready and present in my mind, thought Quinn and thought about the latest addition to his mindscape. Let's see if he can even get to that point. Quinn slightly raised his chin in confidence and locked his eyes with Dumbledore. With a barely noticeable smile gracing his lips, his shields went into active mode as they solidified, and the radiation edges started emitting waves of mental probe degradation magic. Dumbledore, who saw Quinn lock eyes with him, gathered his magic and engaged his mental magic to cast legilimency. The mental probe went forward and was about to reach Quinn's mind when the two parties heard a pop. Dumbledore and Quinn broke eye contact and looked towards the direction of the sound. There they saw a house elf standing with a letter in his hands. I guess my ticket is here, thought Quinn when he saw the letter in the house elf's hands. It came at the right time. It's good to see I know him well. What is Gallery? Asked Dumbledore to the house elf who had the responsibility to clean up his office, and was the only elf who was allowed to enter the headmaster's office. A letter came for the headmaster, said Gallery the house elf and handed the letter to Dumbledore. One of me kind popped to Hogwarts and told us house elves to give this to you and give it fast. Gallery then twirled his fingers and spoke in a distracted voice. She wore pretty toga and was so pretty. Like the best elf, Dali had ever seen, so pretty. Quinn's eyes smiled when he heard the little house elf spoke in a dreamy tone. Of course, she is pretty. Dumbledore opened the letter as the Gali the Hogwarts house elf popped away. He began reading it, and Quinn didn't see any reaction on the headmaster's face before he looked up and spoke. It seems your grandfather doesn't want me to speak to you without his presence, Mr. West. I see. Rewinding back time to the moment Quinn had opened the door in the shrieking shack. The second Quinn saw the men inside the room, he was sure of one thing, one thing that was sure to happen. Quinn thought about the future, and no matter what decision he took, Every path led to him meeting the old man in the tower and talking about what happened today. All paths lead to Albus Dumbledore. And at that time, the meeting with Dumbledore became his main priority, and Quinn started to prepare for it. The first thing Quinn had to do was to get out of there alive. And make sure Harry Potter wasn't hurt and taken away. Doing this was easy enough. But when he added Dumbledore to the equation, Quinn had to select his methods. He took the physical way rather than the magical way. Quinn started by discreetly disarming the hostage taker. The door shutting close made sure that no one noticed that fact, meaning if Dumbledore examined the memory, he wouldn't find a wand flying because Quinn made sure that the wand went in a direction that wasn't visible to the marauders. Quinn didn't want to show his actual magical capabilities to Dumbledore. But because the door was closed with magic, Quinn decided to use his reputation as a prodigious student to explain that he had enough wandless skills to close the door. But that was it. Quinn couldn't show any more, so he turned to his trusty fists and battered the man into submission. Going physical and hurting wasn't only to hide his magic. Quinn needed time to prepare. He made sure the marauders knew he was hurt so they would take him to the hospital wing. This went great because Harry Potter was unconscious and needed medical attention, and Quinn simply tagged along. The reason Quinn wanted to go to the hospital wing was to separate from James Potter. He didn't want to meet Dumbledore right off the bat and wanted to prepare his exit ticket in advance. 
In the hospital wing, there were two options. Number one, Dumbledore would come to the hospital wing and talk to him there. In this option, Quinn wasn't able to set up the exit ticket, but he would have an audience who would see him and Dumbledore talk. He would have Poppy and most probably the rest of the Potter family in the hospital wing. If Dumbledore asked to talk in private, Quinn would have refused and would reply that they could talk about it in front of everyone. That he trusted Poppy and that the Potter family deserved to know what happened. This way, Dumbledore would have to carefully tread if he tried some hanky-panky. The second option was Quinn being called into the headmaster's office. Which was the version of events that happened. In this option, Quinn had further sub-possibilities. The possibility was the messenger, who would escort him to Dumbledore. On the scale, Quinn had someone like Severus Snape who wouldn't listen to any of his requests on one side and someone like Phileas Flitwick, who was much more empathetic and would allow Quinn to go into his office. With everyone else in between these two people. Quinn's blood-stained clothes weren't an incident. He could have come out of the mess without a single speck of dust on him. Quinn needed to go to his office so that he could prepare his exit ticket. The exit ticket was a Magifax mail sent to every Magifax unit inside the West Manor. Quinn had sent the same two pages that he drafted while changing clothes to Ms. Rosie, Elliot, his grandfather, and to the Magifax unit for general use at West Manor. The two pages covered the events, what was about to happen, and some instructions. If Snape had come to escort Quinn and had refused his request to change clothes, Quinn would have directly called Polly, who was the one who had delivered the letter to the Hogwarts house elves and would have given her a short message for his grandfather. Quinn was confident that even with a short message, his grandfather would have pulled off the same thing as he had done now, and he would get his exit ticket. Quinn had used Magifax because Phileas, the charms master, was sitting right outside. Quinn wasn't sure if Phileas would be able to detect a sudden ward that Quinn would have cast to silence the elf apparate pop of Polly, arriving to collect the pages. He was okay with Snape seeing him speaking to Polly because after being refused a change of clothes, Quinn had the justification of complaining to his grandfather. Then came the talk with Dumbledore. Quinn didn't know what would happen in the office. The talk could have gone pleasantly where he and Dumbledore could have exchanged pleasantries, and after making sure that Quinn was fine, Dumbledore allowing Quinn to leave and rest. But Dumbledore pulled out a file on Quinn and started to ask questions that didn't have anything to do with today's incident. Dumbledore brought up everything from his grades to his thoughts about various subjects and his activities. Quinn knew that there was a possibility that Dumbledore would try something, and thus he wanted to get out of the office, and his grandfather's letter was enough to accomplish that. But to make sure that it got here in time, Quinn had to make sure that he extended the conversation without revealing too much. Dumbledore using legilimency was within Quinn's expectations. Quinn knew the power of legilimency, he used it every day. So, he knew that if Dumbledore could, he would use legilimency because if Quinn was in his place, he would have done the same thing. Sure Quinn was confident in his acclumency, but his opponent was Dumbledore, and Quinn knew that the over-hundred-year-old man was strong. That is why Quinn went to all the trouble to create an exit ticket. In the words of George West, the exit ticket told Albus Dumbledore to back off and leave his grandson alone. Albus Dumbledore was magically and politically powerful, but he lacked the financial wealth that George West had plenty of. If Dumbledore refused to heed his warning, George would make his life difficult. The saying that money made the world go round was built on solid ground. Dumbledore looked up from the letter towards Quinn stated, it seems your grandfather is aware of the incident. So it seems, nodded Quinn. I wonder how he got to know them so quickly, inquired Dumbledore. I wouldn't know, headmaster. My grandfather is a resourceful man. I'm sure he has his way, replied Quinn, not admitting that he was the source. Quinn put the folder which held the information on him back on the desk. He had already glanced at it and just needed to use a clumency to strengthen what his eyes saw. It seems we would have to end our talk, sir, smiled Quinn as he got up from his chair. As much as I enjoyed our talk, my grandfather has the authority to ground me for the entire summer, and I don't want that. Dumbledore glanced between the letter and Quinn and nodded. Quinn turned back and walked towards the door but stopped when he heard Dumbledore speak. Detentions till the end of the term, Mr. West for sneaking outside the castle without permission. Quinn didn't turn back and simply replied with, I understand, sir. 
and then walked out of the office, leaving behind Albus Dumbledore alone, with a letter from George West. Outside the office, Quinn took a deep breath with a big smile and thought. That went rather well. The first meeting between Albus Dumbledore and Quinn West had come to an end. This marks the end of part 42 of the story, Magical Journey in Harry Potter World. Thank you for listening. Please like the video and hit the subscribe button to listen more. Hit the bell icon to get notified of all the new content uploaded to the channel ASAP.